I left a marriage sober mm. and I left a marriage um, that when I, when I got out of treatment in 2014, I had set some real healthy boundaries for myself and um, those boundaries weren't honored. Mm. Um, and, and, and I had to leave that situation. Uh, it was very difficult. Nick Sheremy, thank you for joining me on Knocking Doors Down. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. This is a white whale. I've been bugging you for what a good six months. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's uh it's it's been a little it's been a little bit and and uh, you, uh just I'm truly humbled and honored, man. That you know I know I've been busy, but I know you're busy as well. So thank you for taking your time out to to talk to me. I'm really grateful. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and I'm joking people, Hick and I were joking before we hit record. He's uh incredibly busy with your acting, which I I just love and looking forward to so much of your work. And I mean, goodness, I've seen your likeness in advertisements and other things. You just have this wonderful face for it and demeanor. And <laughs> and, uh, and it's going to be so neat to ple- see you play something such an antithesis of yourself that's a little more cold-hearted and calculating and uh but anyways, I digress. So, what I, you know, one of the reasons I, I really was drawn to you do so much beautiful stuff on social media, just sharing your thoughts daily, which um, for me personally, I've had it like I'm getting chills. I've had tough days where, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional too, where just the stuff you've posted like has made a difference. I got to imagine I'm not the only person that's told you that. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been pretty, um, blessed by sharing a message and then receiving the other end of that message from someone who really needed to hear it. There's been some really intense um, situations where, you know, some, some real heavy stuff where people was like, you know, like I was going to end my life that day. And it's, it's a lot of weight to carry. Um, You know, but as you know, just as well as I do in, in, in recovery and, 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 and living a, a, you know, a, a sober life, the giving back in, in, in any way that we can, you know, I, people come to me like, thank you so much. Like I read something and I just really needed that day. And I really needed, I really needed this. And I really needed it. And I'm like, man, I needed that that day, <laughs> right. you know, like I needed that that day. And, and, and I'm grateful that I have a partner because sometimes I'm far from perfect. And I'll put something out there and she's like, Hey, you remember what you, you remember what you, you fed other people. Right. And she'll call me out on my bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best kind. And I'm grateful to have someone like that in my life, you know? Uh, You know, so I I just, sometimes it's something I'm going through. Sometimes it's something that I was going through a couple years ago and it pops up in a memory and I'll, I I just kind of want to share it again or, um, but I think the, 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 the giving back constantly in any form, what you're doing here with this podcast and then, you know, me sharing a message maybe on social media is, is uh, it continues to teach us that we're still learning and we're still able to share our strength, hope, and courage with, with others. And together, you know, we, we're, we're, we're winning and yeah. beating this thing that, yeah. that has, has whipped our butt for so long, you know? Yeah. Well, I got to ask you though, cause I've, I've had those situations with my partner where it's a complete 180 <laughs> cause uh, before, especially in active addiction, those little nuggets of, of calling me out in a good way, I would have never have accepted. Yeah. And look, man, like it's, it's still hard to accept sometime, you know, uh, you, you know, especially her and I have busy lives and, uh, you know, I, I love her with all my heart and she loves me with all her heart, but you know, she knows who I am. So if she sees me veer off, she's not afraid to let me know. And uh, sometimes, you know, we we're stubborn and we like, we're not seeing it. And I I, I try to come as quick as I can to it, you know, to come to Jesus moment and say, Oh crap. Like she's spitting out some truth to me. And I really need to like step away, take my time and reflect on this and, 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 you know, get back 
you know, balanced again and, and moving. So, you know, she's never seen me um, intoxicated on any kind of mood altering chemical, um, you know, so and she's got a little over a year, uh, a year and a half of, of sobriety. Uh, so she doesn't know me as a drinker. Uh, she doesn't know how, you know, how I was. She hears the stories and she hears the testimonies and she hears from other people. Um, so, yeah, if if I would have been drinking and she would have came at me with something like that, calling me out on my own bull crap and not co-signing what I was trying to do, uh, I would have definitely taken a, a completely different <laughs> way. I would have been wrong, that's for sure. And it would have been my fault, you know, that's for sure. And, you know, she would have been crazy and I'd have been completely fine. Yeah, I just drank like almost a gallon of vodka in the past 24 hours. But, hey, like, I'm right, you're wrong, you know. Yeah, I'll do well, actually. <laughs> uh, and it's interesting you bring up, your, you know, your partner, year and a half, man. Tell her congrats. That's awesome. Um I, I, I noticed for me in dating sober, I cannot be with someone that is a drinker. I just can't do it. We, we I left the marriage sober mm. and I left the marriage um, that when I, when I got out of treatment in 2014, I had set some real healthy boundaries for myself and um, those boundaries weren't honored. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I had to leave that situation. Uh, it was very difficult. It was very difficult. And, and, you know, you, you know, uh, especially like you said, going out, you know, dating and, and, um, and it's, it's not so much, you know, you and I, we're growing and I'd like to think that we're growing because of where we've been and what we've been through that we like to continue to grow St- staying stagnant for people like you and I, and I'm, I'm, I say you and I, but I'm speaking of my own, you know, experience yeah. is, is, is no good for myself. Uh, so when you're in a partnership and you're continuing to grow at a rate where it, alcohol is not involved and chemicals aren't involved and you have a certain lifestyle with foundations that you set and you've set certain healthy boundaries. So when, when you're, when you're doing that and another person's doing what they do, uh, it's kind of hard to grow together, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's really hard. And, and when you look at a relationship where we all thrive to have what we want is we want somebody that grows with us, not at our rate, but is willing to grow with us and, and you're willing to grow with that person. Uh, so when alcohol wasn't removed from the house, when, you know, I lived for many years in a house stocked with alcohol, sober. Mm. Uh, I went to many events where this person was heavily drinking and I was having to deal with it and I was having to, you know, and dealing with the, 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 uh, how can I say this dealing with the, well, you're no fun and you're no, you know, this is, you know, so you always want, you, you know what I'm talking about, man. And I think I've heard it <laughs> listening to this, that has been in that situation can easily relate to that. Um, you know, so now I have someone in my life who um, grows with me yeah. and isn't afraid to come to me when they may see me veering off from that growth and help me said straight and vice versa, you know, me towards her. And then I live with someone who alcohol isn't a part of their life. Right. And who can come with me to an event where there is alcohol and neither one of us partake in it. Our motives for being there are out, way outside of, of alcohol. And when we're done, we're done. Yeah. You know, I'm an introvert, believe it or not. I do a lot of these interviews. I'm active. I'm a real introvert. She's introverted. You see? So, <laughs> and, uh, uh, You know, so when you find that person who not only understands what what you're not, you know, going through in your everyday life and someone who can relate to it, uh, I think that's a very special thing. I have two friends. I'm sure you very well of Tim Ryan and and Jen. Yep. They're magic. You know what I'm saying? They they they've both they've they both living. They both know where they come from. They both know where they can be. They both know, and they both choose every day 
to continue to grow each other, spread a message and, 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 and be, um, you know, who they truly are is, is just of a, you know, all of us is we want to be of sober mind and sober heart, you know, rather be in our relationship or any relationship we have. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it, for me, it was, and I'm glad you brought up boundaries. I, it, I would people please. And that's what I had a fall off uh, February 15th. I'll be two years sober again. Um, and it was related to that, that, that lack of ability to build those boundaries and not people please and not get out of a situation and just stay out of something and just go, you know, all the best wish you all the love in the world, but just can't associate with you on yeah, any level. This. Yeah. And it's tough because uh, I genuinely love people and I, I'm sure you do too, but man, I got to. <laughs> And it's, and, and you know, Jason, it's not that we don't love them. It's we love ourselves enough to set that healthy, healthy boundary. You know, like most people get real offended when you set a healthy boundary. And we not, I'm not setting a healthy boundary because of you, mm -hmm. for you. I'm setting a healthy boundary for me. That doesn't make me love you or like you any less. But what it does is it gives me um, some kind of, you know, boundary uh, as to how far I'm going to go into maybe what's happening or what's going along with you or what's, you know, cause you know, of, of all things, you know, people can drain you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, and it takes a lot of discipline on, on, on our end to, you know, set that healthy boundary. Say, this is the only time I can allot this person. Mm -hmm. This is the only time that I can give this person. And, and after so much, like, I, it's not that I don't love you. It's not that I don't care about you, but I care and love me enough. I care for me and love me enough to have that boundary set, you know, and yeah. it's a tough one, especially when you're a people pleaser. <laughs> it is. It's, yes. it's, really, it's really tough. And in the, in the beginning of my sobriety, I was a people pleaser because I had all this respect that I thought I needed to win back. Right. Right. We lived this certain life for so long, you know, in my hometown, 10 years ago, I couldn't freaking walk into any kind of business or uh, any kind of event. And if I did, they're like, oh, he's here. Something's going to get messed up. Like something's going to happen. Something's going to get messed up. You know, and two years ago from Mardi Gras, I had the sheriff step out of the car and like come shake my hand and take a picture with me. You know what I'm saying? So like we, we in the beginning, we want that respect. But what I figured out was is that when we first get sober, and I'm not saying like the first couple of weeks, the first couple of months, this took years for me. So when we first get sober, we, we, how can I say this? You know, we, we, we have that people please, and we, we can say whatever we want and we can put ourselves wherever we want. But ultimately, man, what I, what I realized was, is that my walk, told my story and it took about three, four years before people and, and amends. And, and it took a lot of work and, and you know, it, I'm still, I still make amends and, and I still mess up and I, I'm still not perfect. But in the beginning, it's like, we want that back so quick. We kind of want to look like we want to be accepted so quickly, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And we could talk to talk and we could say all we want and we could, present ourselves how we want, but ultimately it's time and it's our walk in that time. And people are like, Holy shit. Like he changed his life. Yeah. Like he changed the way he lives. He changed the way he, and it all boiled down to me, like loving myself. Yeah. I mean, that's what it, that's what all it is boils down to is like loving myself, not enough to get messed up, yeah. you know, and destroy everything in front of me. Uh, so I think in the beginning, like it, it's tough, it's tough for people in the beginning of sobriety and, uh, uh you know, it, it, it's still tough today in the industry. I'm in, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that we, but we get better at, uh, I think handling it. We get better at, um, setting boundaries. We get better at our walk and we get better at understanding that we don't need to be accepted everywhere, that we know who we are in that process. We learn who we are. Yeah. You know, and once you learn who you are and you're comfortable with who you are, you really don't need too much acceptance from anyone. Right. 
No, I agree. I I finally hit a point in my life, and I said this to to my girlfriend that I'm like, for the first time in my life, because I grew up in the home a home of addiction, so that un, un, unstable environment all the time, unstable relationships. And not that I didn't. Ha- I was an unstable one in many of my relationships. I had really good women that loved me, but you know, I did have a drawing point, um, which I won't go into. But I I was like, I finally feel a sense of home. And it was the people there because my kids and her are the most important people in my world. And like, I'm good there. Like the rest of the world, I don't know. Am I bringing in an income? Do I feel good about what I do? Yeah. Okay. But I know I got love here within my walls and, and just really coming to that realization at 44 years old is like, wow. So this is what this feels like. This is pretty great. <laughs> you know, I don't want to go back. We're the, we're the same age. Yeah. You're 78, baby? Uh, yep, yep. August. May. Okay, cool. We're <laughs> the same age. Man, you look way younger than me. <laughs> well, it's not been recently, but I but I dye the beer. I get one nice gray streak here. So <laughs> I, I've tried to go as, as awesome as yours. And it's funny, before we recorded, you're talking about the bearded villains. And I have a couple buddies that are in there. One guy. Oh, really? Yeah, this buddy of mine, Byron Rush, who he was, uh, uh, I worked with him in professional wrestling. We did uh, TV commentary together. So he was like, you ever get it good enough, maybe you can join. I'm like, ah, you know, I'll try, buddy. But it gets about this long, and then it's it's unmanageable. I, uh, I, I want to touch on, you talked about growing up in a home of addiction. I, I also uh, grew up in, in the home of addiction. And yeah, I was going to ask you. Grandparents I, and my both grandparents side and, and, and both parents uh, was a, di- I mean, at a young age. I was in a meetings and, and NA meetings and wow. uh, you know, it, it didn't really mean anything to me. Uh, but uh, my, my dad was a, was a very bad alcoholic and, and my mother was a very bad drug addict. She lost her battle to drug addiction in 2012. Uh, my father recently passed last year um, sober, but due to complications of, not taking care of himself and drinking for so many years. Um, but he, he did die, um, a dry drunk, you know, never, uh, found what worked for him. Um, but you know, so when you started to talk about where you grew up, the patterns, right. Mm -hmm. This, uh, this, this pattern, this, this cycle that you and I grew up in and we carried on into our relationships and we, we carried it on into, into our lives and uh, it's, you know, not until now we can sit back and, and we can see where we picked up a lot of our habits from and where we picked up a lot of the way that we understood what a relation, what we thought what a relationship was, what we thought what a family dynamic was. And, and, and even though at a young age, I can remember my mom like shooting up and, you know, at, 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 at four or five years old, uh, I, I became addicted to codeine. Uh, okay. At a very, very young age, I had uh, some procedure done and, and, and I would literally, and my mom and I got to spend a lot of time together, and unfortunately, uh, in active addiction. And she had shared a lot of, of, of things with me um, from when I was a child. And, I, and there's some memories I recall, and I can remember begging and crying for quitting. And I remember having to go to the doctor to get like a, a it was liquid coating, a prescription refilled. It's like, I needed it. I needed it. I wanted it. Uh, so I don't remember at a very young age, uh, my family playing a big role in, in me understanding, you know, uh, I shouldn't say understanding, but me uh, associating with you know, drug addiction and with alcohol and, and just abuse, period. Yeah. Uh, you know, my father was a very mean drunk. Um, my, my mother was a... a, a you know, she left us like when I was in the fourth grade and my dad raised us, he had got sober and, and raised us, but he was, he was a dry drunk. So I still wasn't getting that. Um, and he had some really great wisdom. My father, he was a hard ass and, and uh, he's a funny man. And he had some really good wisdom. I got a lot of good things from my father. Uh, I got perseverance from my father uh, because he took on two young boys and, and, and raised them when there was, you know, nobody else wanted that task. Um, you know, he left me with some wise words of, you know, uh, 
you know, you use your head, your ass is going to pay for it. I still <laughs> with me in, in everything I do. Uh, you know, my father was a good, and my mother was a, was a good woman. She was just a, a lost woman that, that never, um, got to experience the gift that you and I are experiencing, yeah. you know, and it's, it's a tragedy and, and I loved her dearly. Uh, but you know, I, I could see where, um, growing up in the conditions and environment that you and I grew up in is, is ultimately leads us to failure, yeah. you know, at relationships, at jobs, you know, cause even a job is a relationship, you know, you have a relationship with who you work for and you have a, uh, you know, so, you know, as well as I do that being as old as we are, I think I was 36 when I got sober 2014, I think it was 36. Uh, we have to relearn everything, man. Like yeah. we have to relearn everything. I remember this old sponsor telling me like, if all you can do is crawl, crawl, you know, <laughs> like I didn't even know how to walk yet. Uh, I didn't know how to love. I didn't know what, honesty was like oh gosh even, yes you know i didn't and not only like you know they talk about and and i'm not again a specific on what program i work i worked the 12 steps in my life uh, as much as possible and and that's where i got sober with the foundation of alcoholics anonymous um uh, you know and, and it's i'm about whatever works for you man like if you're happy and you're living a good life and you're sober and you're a good person like whatever you're doing keep doing you know like that's what i'm about i'm not one of these like hard or you know uh but you know getting getting um back to that is uh you know ha having um kind of forgot where i was going with this but having a foundation of um you know alcoholics and i was I, like i said i used that i really forgot where i was going with this uh we were talking about our childhood and that foundation of uh just the instability Right, right. So, uh, you know, ha having to rewire my brain, uh, not only, you know, um, relationship wise, you know, love wise, and uh, but I had to rewire my brain into going into uh, like, I don't need this to function. But well, how do I function without mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Right. So and that's when these big things started coming up, like, you know, love, honesty uh, you know, my character, uh, you know, so in the beginning it, it was, it was this process of like, who am I here? I am. I'm 36 years old. Like, who am I? What is love? You know? Oh, I remember where I was going with that. So, uh, getting back to, you know, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, is that admit that admit, right. That admit, uh, and, uh, you know, the, I was talking about the honesty thing and, and, it was, it was not only learning how to be honest with everyone, but it was like, how do I be honest with, with me, mm -hmm. you know? And, and you know how it goes. We, we learn what acceptance is and uh, it, in time we accept who we were, we accept who we are in that moment and we accept who we are trying to become and, and what comes with who we're trying to become. Uh, you know, so that whole admitting thing, and, and I think this is what I was trying to get at, is, is you know, it's, it's admitting is not only an outward thing, it's an inward thing. And, you know, there's some people that I've spoken with, and they didn't really grasp that concept. And I'm like, you know, before we can ever admit, because I can easily, when, and I know when you were in active addiction, addiction into whatever your choice was, is, is you knew what you were, Right. You know, yep. people want to tell us what we are. We know damn well what we are. We got to wake up and try to look at ourselves in the mirror every day. And we know exactly what we are. Yep. Right. And we can admit to people, yeah, I'm a junkie. I'm a drunk, you know, and, and, you know, I got to the point to where like, I almost had accepted that that's what I was going to be the rest of my life. Yep. Like this is what I'm going to be the rest of my life, you know? But then I had to really admit to myself, like deep, deep down inside, like, this is what I am. Yeah. Is this what I truly want to be for the rest of my life? You know, it's like, is this truly what I want? Yeah. And here comes honesty. And I didn't really know how to be honest with myself, but honestly, that's not what I wanted for the rest of my life. You know, 
I mm-hmm. wanted to, I wanted to love, I wanted to love me enough not to drink or put a needle on my arm or take a pill or, you know, I wanted to love, I wanted to grow, yeah. you know, I wanted to, um, I wanted to remember things. <laughs> right. I, I wanted to, I wanted to remember things. And, and uh, uh, I mean, how many beautiful things happen in our lives that we've, we don't remember, no. you know? So um, I noticed jump from the, from the whole, the whole family thing into this conversation we having, but uh, it's, it's hard to be brought up in that environment and to thrive as a functioning, loving, compassionate, yeah. honest human being. Yeah. You know, it is. And it's, I never sit there and I say, it's my mom and dad's fault that I ended up so screwed up. Because there's one thing that I had and it was free will. Yeah. I just didn't know how to use free will <laughs> but, uh, for good, but I had free will. I knew right from wrong. Right. Yeah. yeah. It didn't help, but ultimately it was, it was, it was my choice. But it was tough for people like you and I, you know, because when we got to those choices, we've seen people before us that we look, even though it, what they were, we looked up to them because they were our parents and we loved them. Yeah. You know, it was the only love that we knew. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that affected our choices. Greatly. Uh, you know, cause I, both sides for sure. My mom, um, never struggled i think it was recently we had a conversation and she went i went well mom you drink when i was a kid and she goes not for that long and i go yeah you did quite it kind of quit at some point was that when you had cancer she goes no i realized that men twice my size were getting drunk and i wasn't feeling anything so i was scared so i stopped because you know her dad died of alcoholism i've got two uncles, one aunt gone from this disease, you know, sex and love addiction on my dad's side. My dad was, you know, crank mainly, but, you know, drink and all those things too. And so, you know, I just look back and go, gosh, how much subconscious living did I do where I wasted so much time of life subconsciously just, just reacting as opposed to, you know, thinking something out and taking any sort of action. And I think it's so important, like you said, that honesty with yourself. For me, that is so connected to the part, if you are a 12-step person in the big book where it says the restore to sanity because you start taking action because you've gotten real with yourself. You know, I know it. I had a restore to sanity moment. I got served a drink and went, played it out real quick at how bad my life would go real fast if I drank that drink, yeah. you know, and that thing went in the garbage. It's, you know, we get that point and that's a powerful thing to have occur. Yeah, I, I, I agree, man. And, and, um, you know, you, you said your mom, uh, I don't know if you have this, this fear now, but you know, your mom said she was scared, right? She stopped and it kind of makes like guys like you and I think, and, and, you know, women also and who, who, whomever is, 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 you know, in our position, uh, to is like, you know, why we didn't get to that point, you know, like, well, <laughs> well, it could be like, I was scared, but what I think the beautiful thing is, is now I can see, and I, and, I, and I truly believe in this and I don't know how you feel about it, but I have a fear and I, and I truly believe it to be a healthy fear of not being in control of my own thoughts and actions. Yes, because for so long I wasn't. For for so long I wasn't in control. Of whatever chemical was in me, you know, obviously amp- amplified that reaction or, or what emotion, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, so now I have this real healthy fear of 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 not um, having anything alter my mood. You know, uh, because I and it, and it's not so much of of uh, you know because I had to sit back and like really look at this. It's like okay, it's because I want to be in control. You know, it's like, no, I want to be in control of who I love, which is me now, because I don't want to lose that love, not only for me, and I don't want to, I don't want to lose it from others. You know, so it's, I think it's a healthy fear that um, I have that, you know, I, I don't, don't want to ever not be in control of my thoughts and actions of my walk ever again. 
I agree wholeheartedly. I've had enough nightmares, you know, those sober nightmares. I know I'm not the only person in recovery that has them that it it's it 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 scares me in a great way because I really do love where I'm at. I love this moment right now talking to you. It's the the trippy thing that's happened for me in recovery is finding a uh, gentleman such as yourself that it's just like boy, this, this person, move, I'm going to follow them just because they move me. And then it's, you know, one of my biggest things, because I am an introvert, I don't want to bother people. But I was like, I got to ask them if they'll come on here and talk. And and like now here we are and so many other great people. I'm going to talk with Tim Ryan, who you mentioned again on another one of my podcasts for the foundation I work for. And, you know, all these great connectivity because it's the opposite of addiction is connectivity. It's not sobriety connectivity and it's like yes, happening yes. and it just it's baffling and it's awesome and i just praise the god i do business for and and i'm thankful because it's like okay right, am i doing purpose today awesome awesome okay thank you i appreciate thank you for another day you know and and being in that moment like i said being in that moment something i never had the capacity to do and, 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 you know, you brought up a good point in, 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 in and we're, what you're doing here and in, in this connection and this, it's just further proof that we're not alone. You know, when we're out there using and, and we were getting high and, and we had that group and or whomever we put ourselves around, uh, you know, we didn't think we were alone. We're like, oh man, we're not alone in this. You know, mm. he's messed up too. And man, I get you. I get what this is. I get what that is. I get, but individually we were just all alone some lost souls all alone and here we are now um to where like men women them they whomever can sit here and connect and really relate you know if you and i want to talk tonight i'd have never known that you came from a um you know a home of addiction i would have never known you were like my age right. uh you know you, i think you and i have touched some things that we can really agree on that we've both experienced, you know, so this is the time we're not alone, right? Yeah. This is the time when I, like, my girlfriend's listening to this and she was, you know, she talks to me a lot about her sobriety and every once in a while, cause she's a year and a half into it. And early on, she would hit me up and she'd be like, I had this dream and it was so real and it made me. And so like now she's hearing you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's hearing you and, you know, so, uh, even though I was there saying, yeah, you know, I had those two and eventually they go away and, you know, I've wake, I've woken up from them to where I was like, <laughs> I've drank in a dream, woke up in a dream, thanking God I didn't drink, but I was still in the dream and I could smell alcohol. I mean, I'm like, did I, and then wake up from it and be like, oh, oh, thank God. It's not real. It's not real. So she's, she, now she got to hear you. Yeah. You, you know, so there's that connection now. Now she's now I'm sure in her head and I would like to think that she's maybe saying like, well, that's somebody else, too, that, yeah. you know, so uh, the connectivity thing is 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 so important because not only we get to share our individual strength, courage and hope with each other is that we also don't feel alone in it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then now this bond has been made and you can reach out to me anytime you want. You know, I know I can reach out to you anytime I want. Absolutely. Maybe I can't talk to who I need to talk to when I'm like having some shit day, you know, Hey, I know who I can reach out to. Let me reach out to Jason. He might read it. And you may come back to me with some shit and be like, I might be like, Oh, that's what I needed to hear. He gets it right. He yeah. gets it. So that connectivity is so important, which the foundation, the platform you are on right now is a huge, huge, part of service work yeah right because what you know if you go back to the 80s and you go back to the 70s and decades and decades and decades before that what you and i are talking about right now was really taboo oh right? yeah you didn't talk about it you didn't talk about it and if you did it was in a smoky room with a lot of coffee <laughs> everybody was older than you and and i'm not saying look let me i learned a lot from old timers man yeah i learned a lot from old timers but they had a way we live in a different world now, right? Where mm -hmm. everything is faster. Everybody wants instant gratification. They want results. Communication is key in the world we live in. So this right here is probably the best tool that we have. Gosh, right? I hope so. 
I sure hope so. It, it is, man, because it, and we're a prime example of it right now. And the other guests I've seen you have on, you getting that connectivity. And then whoever's going to listen to this is going to connect, right? If, even if they heard your podcast before or they didn't, you know, I guarantee you as a person that's in sobriety or a person that is, is fighting for their life and they're going to hear something. It may be one word, it may be a sentence, it may be a whole podcast. You don't know, yeah. you know, but I think um, it takes a lot to share it. Yeah. I think it takes a lot to put the time you put into it, obviously. I mean, you told me what your schedule was just today. <laughs> that's a lot of service work, right? Uh, I don't know what else to do with myself. Like I said, I, that's a hands off the wheel type stuff. Yeah, right. Right. It on yeah. us just being selfless. Yeah. 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 I'm just being selfless, right? No, you know, it, it, it benefits others. It benefits us. Yeah, true. You know, it's, I don't it, get to have these conversations a lot. It, I it, used to, there was a time before I became an actor that I did a lot of these. I did recovery today with, with Rob Hanley. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Feature in, I'm in featured in recovery today magazine. I've did other people's, I've done other people's podcasts, a lot of interviews in sobriety. And, and, you know, uh, I do a lot of other interviews, but they want to talk about acting. They love the part about the sobriety. Ah, they love a comeback, you know? Right. But a lot of them don't know. Now, I'm a choke up. That's all right. You make me how cry hard, too. How hard it was for me to get to that. They don't know the battle. They want to see the lights and the, and the pretty stuff. But they don't know the hours I spent questioning who I am and can I do this? Um, the days where, you know, um, when I lost my father and when I lost, you know, when I, the days that the tools that I learned in sobriety is what kept me going. A lot of people tell me, um, you're so lucky. And I do feel lucky, but I feel like I worked really hard and I owe it to God and my sobriety. All those interviews and all that stuff with my acting and, and, and that's great. It's beautiful. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very blessed. But what I'm most grateful for is being sober. Because without sobriety, I'd have nothing to believe in. At all. No higher power. Not me. And for sure, I'm not, you know, um, if I was good enough to take the path that I took, you know, and what's crazy is in the film industry, I've met a lot of people in sobriety. I was very fortunate to, to meet a lot of people in sobriety. Um, you know, some people, I, some people I worked with in the film industry, I didn't know they were into sobriety till like after a year and something of, of knowing them. They finally just like, hey, you know, man, uh, I'm a friend of Bill too, you know, or, uh, you know, Hey, I, I haven't touched a drink in six years and this is what happened. And, you know, um, I did a movie called obsidian and this very talented actor named Henry Frost. Uh, he was in, uh, BP oil spill movie. And he, he was in a lot of, a lot of things. He was, in, uh, he worked as Matthew McConaughey stand in and then had a scene with Matthew McConaughey, McConaughey and, uh, that period piece that, that they filmed out here. And uh, we we've never met each other and we both show up on set for this movie Obsidian and um, a couple films, most films I play, I'm a drinker um, and, and it's a challenge and we can get into that a little bit if you have time. But uh, what I found out was, was that first day on set, you know, I'm very open about my sobriety and, and director knew and directors like, look, you know, are you comfortable with drinking out of this whiskey bottle? It's going to be tea. And, and I drink a lot of tea, drink, <laughs> uh, a lot of, a lot of freaking tea. Um, and, and we kind of went off to the side of the director talked to me and, and, and Henry approaches me and he said, man, he's like, oh, he's like, it's been a couple months, you know, I gave up, I gave up alcohol. It was, was having problems with it and we kind of bonded over that you know so you 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 wherever you go you're going to meet somebody for me it was you know it's on set or it's at a casting call whatever you end up meeting somebody um 
but yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of roles. For one role, I play a, a, a alcoholic, abusive stepfather. Uh, mm-hmm. Another one, uh, there's a, uh, what was that? Cedar Creek. It's not out yet. Cedar Creek. I play a really. In fact, my girlfriend came with me on set. She had never been on set and watched me work. Hmm. And she came with me on set of that movie and she's never heard me raise my voice. She's, you had never, you had never seen me like that ever. Huh? My first time watching her act. So first time her watching me act and it just so happened up the character's name was Hank. who's a very abusive, physically abusive to child and mother, uh-huh. alcoholic stepfather. Yeah, yeah, and and, and uh, she was coming out of a very abusive. She had came out of a very abusive relationship where alcohol was fueled by alcohol, mm-hmm. and there was a lot. She had a lot of triggers to yelling, and uh, you know, there was a lot of trauma. And uh, so we on set, and I really, I don't think I ran lines with you at all, right? For that, we just read over them. We just, I'm a type of person I'll read over my lines. I won't act them out. I won't act them out until I'm in wardrobe and I'm I'm right there and it's happening. Yeah. And uh, you know, action, right? And I'm stumbling with a beer and I'm yelling and I'm in this woman's face and I'm grabbing her and the director's like, you know, he's like, you want to improv, improv. And there was this this line where and I just I, I so channeled the alcoholic I was like I so channeled the person I was back then. Um, in the scene, I, I'm talking down to her mm. and v- just verbally abusing her. And I shove her into a couch and she comes back up and she decides that she's going to raise her fist to me. Right. This is in the scene. This is written. Mm. And I was supposed to get angry at her and throw her back down. And instead, I just started laughing hysterically at her, completely dehumanized her and screaming. And she was in the corner of the set like, who the F is this? <laughs> like, who is this? Uh, you know, so she she tripped out, man. I mean, she was like, <laughs> you never seen me raise my voice. She never. And then, you know, cut. And then I'm right back to this guy here. And, uh, you know, so it it's it's uh it's challenging to play an alcoholic yeah. you would think i'm like really good at it right we were professional <laughs> right? for a long time but uh, uh I, I i was lucky enough to study with this really amazing acting coach named jim gleason we spent a lot of time in la and uh i don't want to get into the exercise because it's a kind of a secret class he does and it's called the circle exercise. And, sure. Um, that day when I did that exercise for the first time, and this was back in 2018, 2019, I think I just wrapped up Annabellum. And um, I found out that day that as an alcoholic and drug addict with a lot of trauma inflicted from the outer and self-inflicted, Right that because of the 12 steps of alcoholics and and because of the treatment and because of the tools that I had, that that trauma was trauma that I'd healed from. But what I realized was that trauma, those things never, for, I never forgot how they made me feel. Mm-hmm. And this might sound crazy to you, but um, I still all have that here. No. Not crazy at all. I know exactly what you mean. Um, I know where it's at. I know where it lives. And I'm able to use it. And I'm able to put it back where it belongs. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm able to use it in a way to where it helps me with my characters. Um, I remember that day when I figured that out. And it was a really intense uh, exercise. Uh, to where my mom had passed and it was some things I was asking my mother, but it's done in a weird way. And I, like I said, I don't want to get too much into it. Sure. It's a very, very intense um, exercise. And I remember getting in, 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 
in the in the car and i was so tired you know i work in the oil field i have a regular job right. and i balance a lot and i was driving from way south louisiana to new orleans i would work in the oil field during the day and drive at night and take acting classes and then i'd drive back home and be a husband and then i have to be a dad and then i'd have to be an oil field worker that day and i'd go back and i'd drive back to new orleans and, uh, and i remember getting in the car and i was just so tired i was like oh, i gotta drive home and i, said, and I just cried I cried and I cried and it was two times that a couple of times I cried as a, as a, as an, as a, an actor and, and things that happened to me as an actor because of, of my trauma and my sobriety is, is I cried a day in that car and I realized this, I realized that even though I knew it was like almost another push of reassurance that I didn't go through all that shit for nothing. Mm-hmm. That, uh, and I'm sorry if I curse. <laughs> no, go ahead. It, 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 this is mild to some of the episodes. Okay. I, uh, I, I, I realized I didn't go through all that for, for, for nothing. I, I, you know, I really, it was like this big push of reassurance that I was like, all of this happened to me for a reason. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, sh- you know, I don't know if you feel these things that I'll say this real quick. The second time I ever cried, I was filming a movie called money plane. And, and it was the first time I was given my own trailer. And, 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 and then there's an important kind of little tidbit to the story. And, and I hope it helps someone out there is that I remember sitting in that trailer and I remember just crying. Like I started crying. They were like, wardrobe's going to be here in a little while and I'm going to get you to make up. And... <clears throat> but it was like my own big, nice trailer. Yeah. And I was just, I was crying and I kept telling myself, I'm like, I, I don't belong here. I-, I don't deserve this. Like, look where I was like six years ago, five years ago. Like, like how is this happening? Like, I can't. And uh, I remember right there, like, thinking, um, I do deserve this. Like I worked really hard. So I just a little, you know, message for anyone listening that um, one of my things I, I know for myself is, you know, being a drug addict and alcoholic was at, at, and there was a time in my life when good things would happen to us and we felt not deserving of them. And we would completely ruin them because we felt we, we didn't deserve them. If you are sober and you are living a sober life and it comes with a lot. It's not just picking up a drink or picking up a drug and whatever you're into, whatever your thing is. It's about just being a loving and compassionate human being and having an understanding for yourself. That's, you know, evolved deeply in love. Uh, You are deserving no matter what it is. If you win a free raffle, (laughs) you deserved it. We put ourselves through a lot and we finally doing right. We are deserving. Yes, sir. You know, we are deserving. Uh, But I, you know, I remember in in that situation to where I was, uh, I was sitting there literally crying. Like you don't deserve this, but like, yeah, you do deserve it. You know, you, you, you do deserve this. We deserve good things. We do. You deserve good things. I deserve good things. Um, But where I was going to kind of go into and, I kind of want you to just how you what you feel about this because okay. being forty four, I really I recently started to feel these. Man, I'm like halfway through my life. Yes. Like I lived half. I, I was alive and breathing. Some points, almost not, and some points, no. But I was alive and breathing you know, half my life. I really just started living like nine years ago, about eight years ago. Uh, and I'm like, man, we only have so much time left. Right. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I started to remember what uh, happened to me after that acting class in that car. And I was like, but it all happened for a reason, mm-hmm. you know, cause now I'm getting to live a level of life that, um, I never thought was possible because of the crap that I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's the irony well, of my it. Dad said, my dad said, if you don't use your head, your ass is going to, well, my ass paid for it long enough. <laughs> I don't use my, head and my ass no longer pays for it, you know? Um, uh, so, but I, it, I started to ponder yeah. on like, 
just long-term life and like man you know like the average male lives to be this long and i'm 44 and so it's really driven me um it's driven me to accomplish the things that i want to accomplish and when i say it's driven me it's driven my goals but at the same time man it slows it slowed me down yeah um it's 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 and it's setting those boundaries like we talked about earlier it's you know i know where i need to be full speed in to accomplish what i want to accomplish but then i also know where i need to slow down and really embrace and soak in and enjoy these beautiful moments that i'm having in my life absolutely i i i had to do that this weekend it's just kind of like it's it's okay to take the day and sit and you know whatever talk with the kids, uh, you know, hang out with the girlfriend, play video games, whatever we, you know, want to do it. It's okay. You know, and I, I had a gentleman who was on here, Adam Javelin, who's kind of become one of those indirect mentors. And he, he goes, what do you feel you waste too much time on? And I go, I watch a lot of TV and movies. He goes, wait, you studied film and acting and everything else. And he goes, how do you know it's not you studying that still? And then it could prepare you. And all of a sudden, you never know when something else hops up. You know, a lot of people in the biz, maybe they're like, uh, does anybody know a guy that did radio for 20 years? And yeah, I got a friend. He, he's like, you never know. Do you love it? Yeah, I do. I, I get a lot out of stories. It's not just passive watching. And he's like, no time wasted. No, no, oh, definitely not. Definitely not. I completely agree. What you said his name was Adam. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with Adam. Uh, you know, and, and I think what we need to keep believing is that the way we live now and the things we do, um, you with this right now is just these are stepping stones. And in the process of these stepping stones, we're not only helping ourselves, you're helping other people. Yeah. You know, you are, man. You are. Look, I, I, I've been doing this whole social media thing with sobriety since 2014, and it started with a morning and a, a, a night thing. And it's been like that since. Since 2014, well, when I got out of treatment, I got sober December 15th of 2014. And then I started this in end of January 2015. And you can count almost daily that I'm dropping something on social media. I've never got to the level that you want, you know, when I go around and, and, you know, with a podcast and, and, you know, getting, getting people to get their testimony and, and this and that, um, I'm very aware of what's out there in the sobriety world. Sure. And there's three cats right now besides, you know, Tim Ryan and, and, you know, who's out there to dope man himself, uh, you know, and they, you, you have these, you know, other people in sobriety. Uh, but as far as the presence on social media, I see Marty, I see you and I see Higgy. Good old and Higgy. You you guys are like y'all the three guys I pay attention to. Oh. Y'all the three guys that I look at and what y'all saying, I, I mean whatever y'all dropping out there, it's, it's resonating with me and it's sticking with me and it's staying with me. Uh I wouldn't be sitting here if not. You know, like uh I believe in you, man, and I believe in what you're doing. And you should be very um proud of yourself. For taking the initiative to do something like this, you know, this is big and, and you definitely have a presence. And it's so important. It's so important that you do because there's a lot of people out there who need this. There's a lot of people out there and you know how bad they're hurting and you know how bad they're struggling and they need this. They may not know what they need it now, but when they're ready, when they want when they want to, I'm telling you, these, this, what's happening is in an archive and it lasts forever. You know, so you're setting a foundation etched in stone, you and these guys that are lighting a path up for people who are very lost. So just always remember your why, man. Yeah. Well, thank you for the reminder. It's not often they, um, I get choked up when a guest shares their story, but that's, I think this is the first time someone's saying something that means more than, you know, because I don't think I've ever talked about this. There's, you know, been changes with this podcast and there's been many a times I wanted to quit, but thank you for that reminder yeah, of why welcome, I man. haven't. 
remember your why. Ugh. Always remember your why. I, I try to remember my why every day. We get sometimes we forget. We get and we get complacent and we forget and 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 but man, when you wake up in the morning, you know. And I'm not saying this is your life purpose, but you have a purpose, brother. And you are putting it out there and you're making it happen. You're taking action. So remember your why. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, uh, you want to switch modes? <laughs> I, got a lot, <laughs> I got a lot more questions because we didn't even get into the parenting and talking to our kids. Uh, okay, but, I, shoot. but I have a feeling we could go for another half hour at least on that. Uh, Cause your kids are doing awesome stuff. I love the stuff with your daughter. I, so my daughter, she's having some real image issues. I just want to share this and maybe share this with your daughter. Um, she's really struggling, you know, 13 going on 25. And, um, and I showed her your, your daughter, cause she's really, she's kind of like in this mode of like, you know, where whatever picture has been painted that women can't be strong. And I'm like, yeah, they can. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the, this, this gentleman that's uh, going to come on the podcast, look, look at what his daughter's doing. And she was blown away. So I just oh, wanted to good. share that and maybe get, get that back to your daughter. But it, it inspired her. So she's been doing a lot more like, like, dude, why are you tired? Oh, I was in doing push-ups and sit-ups. It's like, right on. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. She's a, the, the, my little girl's a prime example, man. I mean, that little girl weighed went in there to Turkey weighing a hundred pounds. She's four foot 11. And, you know, she struggled with the same thing, you know, like for her was, uh, you know, she, she was tiny and um, she was a, a, a great basketball player. She actually quit the high school team and started the power lift. Uh, mm-hmm. Being as short as she was, she was a great basketball player. She's got an arm on her. She could throw a football better than any guy her size you know uh but I, I was blown away when she called me up one day and she was like and at the time uh i was filming like ncis new orleans and i was trying to put on some muscle mass and i was in the gym and i had got real big and i was now i just kind of i'm happy with what i am I just, <laughs> i'm joint tendons and ligaments can't handle too much weight anymore but um, she was like yeah she's like i'm gonna try out for powerlifting and and I mean, I'm honest, and I'm honest with it to this day. At first, I was like, oh, God, like, Lola, you, like, at that time, she was, like, 90, 89, 90 pounds, and she had never lifted a weight in her life, but I knew she was strong. And, uh, man, you know, even though I doubted her for a small moment in my life, um, she, she, she proved to me um, – and I'll never forget this, man. She, 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 I remember her saying, she said, if, if you got sober, I can power lift, you know, and, and there's not many moving moments, you know, she's my baby girl and, and you know what our baby girls are capable of us making us feel. And, and, um, it started nine months after I was, I was sober. We were driving. I'm going to tell you something real quick about my daughter. We were driving, and and um, she was very supportive of, of my recovery from the get-go, being nine years old. She was very supportive. Um, she would come hear my testimony. She would come watch me chair a meeting. Uh, she loved to hear my story. No matter where I went and how many times I told it, she loved to hear my story. Uh, but we were driving one day, and she says, so, and now, mind you, I'm, I'm – I'm Cajun French, you know, <laughs> like we have weird nicknames for family, you know, so like grandma is a momo and a, and a papa or a momo and then a grandpa. And she says, she says, uh, you know, granny and papa were alcoholics, drug addicts. And all that. So I said, yeah. And, and we're just driving and she just starts talking to me like this. And now and I'm like, yeah. And she says, and, and she's like, so your daddy's daddy is your dad's dad and grandma were one stuff and I was like yeah and she's like and then your mama's and then she's like and then your dad and then your mom which is her grandparents I was like yeah she said and you were and I said yeah she said but you're not no more and I was like no and <laughs> this gets me every time man <laughs> she says 
she said, well, that's good. She says, that means I don't have to be. And, 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 and right then and there, I knew I broke uh, an ancestral curse, man, a cycle, and that I was able to do this. And, and um, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that they took a lot from, from me. In, in in my perseverance as I took from my father. Uh, but when she told me that, it's it's kind of when I knew that I had, you know, broke a cycle of ancestral trauma. And uh, they knew me as an alcoholic. Um, they still remember me as an alcoholic. Um, and they have no problem with bringing up, you know, something that I, I did when I was drinking. And because I'm very comfortable about talking about it because it's, it's all things that I've accepted and, and they've healed from and I've healed from and you know there's no resentment so my little boy was a little different it took him about two years before he even talked about my sobriety mm. we were sitting on the sofa one day he never talked about it to me at all and he came and cuddled up to me buried his head in my shoulder and he put his arm around my neck and he hugged me real tight and he said I'm really glad you don't drink no more two years later mm. and that was it for him We've uh-huh. never discussed anything after that. And him and I are so close and we have such a great relationship uh, with both my children, you know, so the little shits teach you, man. <laughs> they do. They teach you a lot. And I'm so grateful that they are able to, uh, I was truly, truly blessed man, with some beautiful human beings in my life. Yeah. But no, that that's, um, you got me twice, man. I started to cry again. Um, no, I've had to see that with, with my daughter. You know, I've, I've thought about it a lot lately. Like, uh, why do they ask you to secure your mask first? And I realized I, if I wasn't doing the work on myself that I am now, I wouldn't be able to be there for my daughter and actually have something where there's merit behind it when I talked about loving yourself, you know, and boy. Anyways, before we get too emotional, we could go. Uh, we're gonna have to do a part two down the road for sure, because this was this was awesome, or, or selfishly something where it's not shared with the world, because I I got so much out of this and I'm so grateful. But uh, this is where we jump into some fun random questions. I leave you with the final thoughts. But uh, if people want to find you online, how can they do that, Hick? Oh, uh, you can find me on. Uh... You can look up Hick Sharami on IMDb. You can find me on Instagram. It's uh, Hick Sharami, H-I-C-K-C-H-E-R-A-M-I-E underscore actor. And then you can also find me, Hick Sharami, on uh, Facebook. And that's about all I do. Uh, <laughs> that's all I have time for. <laughs> all right. I have chat like months ago. I'm like, I don't even use this. I'm like, why do I have TikTok? I don't use this. And uh, yeah. but you, can, you can find me on, on those platforms of social media. Awesome. And uh, we'll put those links in the description. So give Hick a follow. Um, All right. Let me try to pull out some random questions that I haven't done before. Uh, One actor, one director you would like to work with. Oh, oh, man. Um, It's hard, isn't it? (laughs) It's so tough. It's 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 so tough. Um, One actor I'd like to work with. I think Jack Nicholson. Yeah. I think Jack Nicholson. I love Jack Nicholson. Um, there's a lot of brilliant actors out there, but he has a range that is just, uh, you know, I'd love to say, uh, I mean, up until two years ago, it was, it was, it was Brian Cranston. Uh, but then I got to work with him. So <laughs> God, he was amazing. He's amazing. He's, oh, I bet. Oh God, he's amazing. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd, I'd have to say, uh, Nicholson and, and director, um, uh, Scorsese, yeah. uh, you know, uh, him or, or Kubrick. I, 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 I don't know, man. It's a, that's a tough question. You sure. know, it could be any, it could be, it could be even people that, that passed away. Sure. Why not? Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna stick with with Scorsese and, and Nicholson. Yeah. yeah, I'll stick with them for now. Uh, I don't want to go too out there. 
uh i can definitely go well and scorsese it's like an actor's director you know you're gonna like i love i'm a star wars nut have been since i was a kid my hobby when i first sought sobriety my first sponsor got me back to building legos like i did as a kid like what did you love to do uh legos and star wars no, you're, you're 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 being for real yeah i have a two bookshelves full of star wars legos dude that's what i do really Legos. <laughs> oh, I, just, I just built the VW bus. Oh, that's right. You did the van, yeah, and I. Dude, that's like my hobby. Yeah, that's I like did. My oh, we got a lot yeah. of common. <laughs> yeah, I did a, a Formula One. They put out the McLaren F1 car, so it was the Connect style. So I did that. The off. I'll send nice. you a picture. Oh, cool, dude. But uh, yeah, I'm all about it. But I would, I would be afraid to work with George because George isn't really an actor's director. You know, it's not like the crowd. It's just like, let's get in, let's shoot this, uh, whatever. We'll fix it in post. You know, I would, I'd want to do a Scorsese type of person too. You know, and get in there and like, okay, they're really wanting a performance out of this thing. Yeah, know? yeah. Like I, I just think it was, it's the that's a kind of director that just really pull, pull it out of you. Yeah. You know, he would really, really pull it out of you, and and I'd be so up for that challenge you know it's funny you talk about kind of almost a, a life experience the last gig i did was for an attorney in oakland california and i was playing a guy that was getting arrested for a dui talk about typecasting <laughs> there <laughs> that, that just came to my head you're like I, method act i got this <laughs> yeah i got it you know look uncomfortable in the handcuffs you think <laughs> Okay. That's awesome. No problem. Uh, now I need you to look shameful while you're calling that family member. Uh, I think I can get this. Yeah. Um, all right. <laughs> uh, you're stranded on a deserted island. You got one music artist and one movie with you. Who are they? Or what are? What is it? Oh, um... oh God. One movie? Dude. You ask some hard questions, man. <laughs> okay, so you said one artist. Yeah, one musical artist. So you could take like a compilation album from them. Okay, so I'd have to have Jerry Garcia. Really, you're you're a Grateful Dead guy, huh? Oh, you even got the shirt on. <laughs> I'm a big uh, Grateful Dead guy, and the Dead and Company is touring for the last time in 2020. Yeah. So I'm already planning it all out to make a show. Um, I bet that's a lot different sober than not. It is. It <laughs> is. It, any show is. Right. Uh, and then this is a dead show, right? right? So, like, you know, like, I'm the 1% in there, right? Like, I'm <laughs> the one person that's not smoking weed or drinking or taking a hallucinogen or right. any taking any kind of mood-altering chemical. But man, you know, I don't know if this is something that you've dealt with, like as in sobriety. I love to people watch, yes. and uh, being being, and, and that crowd is a very nonviolent, peaceful crowd. So uh, being in that type of atmosphere, it's a lot. M make sure you are spiritually fit, mm -hmm. and your motives are for going listen to music and spending time with your insignificant other, listening to music and not that part of the culture. Um, that's things I have to separate even when I go to a award show or when I go to a red carpet premiere or when I, my motives for going there are this. Yeah. And that's it. Uh, as to where years ago, my motives were going for a completely different reason. I was wanting to get lit, lit up, you know? Um, so yeah, it would have to be Jerry Garcia and movie would have to be. Oh man, you, you, that's tough, dude. This is the rest. Like I, if I don't get like, if I don't get rescued, I gotta watch this movie for the rest of my life. Um, it, I want to say one who flew over this cuckoo's nest, but at the same time, I, I, I good good fellas. Me and Jared Garcia watching Good Fellas. Yeah. All right. I was a. It's funny. I was about ready to before you said it. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. I think the most one of the most brilliant Jack Nicholson roles ever. But yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of up there. I I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna go with Goodfellas. Goodfellas is a good one. Uh, but that's funny you talk about concerts because the first date that uh, that my girlfriend and I did went to Kiss, and I'd probably seen Kiss. I think somewhere in the low twenties. Uh, but it was the first time I went sober, and I even said to her, "I'm like, I'm wondering if I'm gonna have fun." 
you know, because I didn't always get, you know, I wasn't a concert a blackout drunk guy. I wasn't the one that people had to haul to the car or anything, but right. I certainly didn't do them sober. And I had a blast. I sang every song. <laughs> we were up dancing. It's it was fun, like, right? I was like, and this you remember great. it all, dude. Yes. Yes. Like, I, I went to a show at the House of Blues once, had like a conversation with Perry Farrell on a bunch of 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 of, of Zan bars and 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 my buddies are telling me like dude you talked to him for like 15 minutes you're having the time you're like, and i don't remember i don't remember meeting the guy i don't remember the concert i don't remember the show uh you know so to to and, and it, it doesn't have to be a concert just anything now experiencing anything and remembering it yeah because you know in the end when it's all said and done we run out of time we money is no longer relevant things are no longer relevant if we're lucky we have the memories right yeah i mean really in the end that's what we have yeah our walk what we left and the memories uh so like these remembering these things these moments of concert uh i remember the first one i went to was i took my children to see the luminaires and it was beautiful it was beautiful i got to see my children enjoy music i got to enjoy music i remembered it all uh, we, I still remember it. And this was back in like 2015, 20 years ago, but I still remember that whole concert. I remember the looks on their faces. I remember. So, you know, whatever it may be, it's just nice to remember. Yeah, absolutely. All right. One more random question for you. If you could have uh, dinner with any one person living or not, who would they be? Uh, uh my father. Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and after we 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 were on really good terms, and you know, even though you think you said everything you have to say, and do everything you felt like you needed to do, uh, once a person leaves this earth and they leave your life, um, you figure out there's so much more that you want. So I'd I'd like to have I'd like to have one nice last supper with him. Uh, Hick, the floor is yours. If you have anything you want to lend to uh, anyone in recovery or just struggling with some things in life in general, what uh, what little little nugget kind of helps you that you might want to share? You know, and and this is from my experience, and, and different things work for different people. But um, what I'd really love for everyone to understand, um, as I understood it is that um, you are not uh, hopeless and broken. Um, you, you never were hopeless and broken. Um, hopeless and broken is such a permanent thing. And, and, you know, you see Jason here and you see myself here and you see many other people that we, I'm sure at one time, you know, maybe Jason did, but I know I did. I felt so hopeless and broken. And, and you're simply not, we're not, um, as they say, we do recover. We do learn to love ourselves enough not to, um, drink or do drugs. Um, and you know, if you get there and I hope to God, anyone that's struggling, listening to this does because the promises they do come true and this is a really beautiful life and and you can make it as beautiful as you want you do have that power of free will and, and freedom of choice um if you do make it and jason and i talked about this a little earlier anytime you doubt yourself what you're doing how you feeling remember your why um remember your why and in the beginning if you do take this journey um it's not easy uh, i'm years into it and it's not easy um you become accustomed to this beautiful life and 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 using the tools that are given to you uh, but it's, it's not easy um but just remember it does get better you know, I promise you, it, 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 it does get better. Everything is not going to come back right away uh, because it took a long time for us to destroy what we, what we could have had. Um, so always remember your, um, 
why when you do get there, if you're doubting yourself. And um, one that I like to do no matter what position I'm in is I never forget where I came from. So don't ever forget where you come from. You're never too good. Uh, remember, you know, I always remember that I was a junkie and alcoholic. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that. Uh, you know, it keeps me real humble, you know, yeah. and, and do for others, you know, but always remember your why. Yeah. Hick, uh, this has been an absolute pleasure and an honor. Good, sir. Oh, thank you, man. Like I said, I'm grateful, humbled and honored that you asked, you know, to speak to me. Um, I needed this. I needed this. Yeah. I don't get to talk about it enough. Um, so thank you. And, and thanks for whoever ends up listening. Um, I, I appreciate you all and I love you all. This podcast contains the views and opinions of the knocking doors down hosts and their guests to the show. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only. And because each person is sharing their unique perspective, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Views and opinions expressed in the podcast and website are our own and do not represent that of our places of work. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. Privacy is of the utmost importance to us. For those wishing anonymity, people, places, and scenarios mentioned in the podcast have been changed to protect confidentiality at the request of certain guests. This website or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limited to establishing standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or website. In no way does listening, reading, emailing, or interacting on social media with our content establish a doctor-patient relationship. If you find any errors in any of the content of this podcast or blogs, please send a message through the contact page. This podcast is owned by KDD Media Company.